we're going to pick up in this presentation where we left off on the last. This presentation is going to deal with pantheism. It's going to deal with the philosophy that's behind the martial arts and Eastern mysticism. That includes all forms of Eastern mysticism. It includes yoga, tai chi, qigong, reiki, uh, energy healing, whatever you want to classify it as. It's all based on this philosophy. So if you would, let's bow our heads together and ask the Lord to be with us. Father in heaven, we come to you tonight in the precious name of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, we can do nothing without you. I can do nothing without you. But Father, your word says that we can do all things through Christ which strengthens us. Father, we ask that you will enlighten our eyes that we might see your glory. Open our ears tonight so that we will hear your voice. And Father, we invite your Holy Spirit to fill our hearts and our minds and your holy angels to guard and protect us. And Father, I pray for each person that is watching across the world, I ask that you will speak to them and inspire them, reveal your love and your power in their lives. And Father, I thank you, for you have promised that whatsoever we ask in the name of your Son, you will do it. In his name, amen. We began this series examining a familiar text of Scripture in Genesis chapter 3. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God, Elohim, doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. This has been Satan's attempt in, in every form of deception. Hath God really said? Does God really mean what He says? Can He be trusted? That's the question that He's asking every human being on the face of the world. What amazes me is how Satan attempted his deception. He said, if you will disobey God, God said, don't eat of this tree or you'll die. Satan said, you won't really die. You won't surely die. But if you eat of this tree, the forbidden tree, you shall be as gods. Scripture tells us something in chapter 1 of Genesis. It says, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Yea, male and female created he them. How much more like God can you be than being made in his image and in his likeness? Satan, we are told from Ellen White, he hypnotized Eve. You can look that up for yourself. She said he was hypnotizing her with his words. He said, you will be like God. But they were already like God. Did they not believe him when he told them? Can you imagine what it was like that first day after Christ had formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life? And Adam opened his eyes and he looked up into the face of his Creator. What was going through Adam's mind? He wasn't a child. He was, he was created in maturity. And he looks up into the face of his Creator. And his Creator knows. He says, I'm the one that created you. You are in my image. This is the choice that every person is being faced with. Choose ye this day whom you will serve. Choose ye this day whom you will believe. I can remember many years ago, my wife was working at a store and 
a man came in, loved the Lord with all of his heart, but without meaning to, I don't think it was intentional, the enemy began speaking through this man. And he started putting questions of doubt in my wife's mind as to her beliefs and as to which day was the Sabbath. And she struggled. She called me from the, from the store after everyone had left and she said, Eric, I don't know what to do. There's these doubts that are running through my mind. And I said, I'll pray for you. And she started praying and I started praying. And one verse from Scripture came out. The Lord spoke to her in her heart and said, Choose you which day whom you will serve. God's Word cannot fail. It stands. In Deuteronomy 30, verse 14 through 19, and there's a reference there to John 6, 63, the Lord tells us, Behold, I set before thee this day life and good, death and evil, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life. That has not changed. Many Christians want to say, that was Old Testament. That doesn't apply to us anymore. This side of Calvary, everything is different. Listen to His words. I have set before you this day life and good, death and evil, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life. And then we hear Christ in the Gospel of John say, For the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Therefore choose life that both thou and thy children may live. There was two choices. The tree of life and the tree of the knowing of good and evil. Now in the King James it says knowledge, but if you look that up in the Hebrew and even in the New Testament and the Greek, the word is knowing. The knowing of good and evil. God tells us in Romans 16, 19, I would have you be wise unto that which is good and yet simple concerning evil. I can remember my children when they were little and I didn't want my son to find a, a pistol that maybe I had or a, a rifle up on top of the, the cabinet. I wouldn't want him to find that. What if you took your child when they were little, six or seven years old, or three years old, and you took them to a friend's house or a family member's house, and you left them inside for a minute while you went out on the back porch, and you didn't know that the television was on. You didn't know that there was a rated R or rated PG movie that was filled with violence and sensuality that was being played in the middle of the day. And your child saw somebody murdered or saw some atrocity. That child should not have to know about evil. You don't have to taste something to know that it's bad. All you need is your father to tell you, don't taste it, it's bad. You don't have to find out for yourself. The tree of life. We have a beautiful reference to this in Revelation 22, verse 1 through 2. And I want you to think and get a picture of what we're, what we're hearing described to us. And He showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. What does water represent in the Scriptures? It represents spirit. It represents spirit and life. Where is this water flowing out of? It's flowing out of the throne. What was in the throne? God's law. Out of His law, which was spirit and life, that water of life was flowing. In the midst of the street of it and on either side of the river was there the tree of life. A tree that came up with two trunks, one on either side of the river of life. Which bare twelve manner of fruits and yielded her fruit every month. And this is a beautiful text of Scripture. Look at this and imagine this. Think about this. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations, the healing of the people. I was reading this one day, and the Lord brought something to my attention. And it was so beautiful. What is paper made out of? It's made out of a tree. What are the pages of a book called? 
leaves. They're called leaves. Leaves from the tree of life. The Lord tells us in Psalm 34, verse 8, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. What He's doing is He's telling us, Try me and see if I won't prove you. Test me and see if I won't fulfill my promises to you. Do you remember what Jesus said when He came across um, the, the lake after feeding the 5,000? He got to the other side and a crowd met Him there. And He said, You're not here because you saw the miracle. You're here because you ate and were filled. What that means is it wasn't an illusion. Christ did not make something appear to happen, but it had no substance. He changed those loaves and fishes into enough food to feed 5,000. And He said, you were filled. You didn't just see it. You tasted it. Your belly was full. My word is satisfying. There's a beautiful text in Isaiah chapter 12, verse 1 through 6. And in that day thou shalt say, O Lord, I will praise thee, for though thou wast angry with me, thine anger is now turned away, and thou comfortest me. Behold, God is my salvation. Remember, we talked about salvation at the last meeting the last presentation. Salvation means delivered, rescued, set free, healed, and made whole. God is my deliverance. God is my freedom and my healing. I will trust and I will not be afraid. For the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. Yea, He also is become my salvation. If you look up the word salvation in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew, more than 80% of the time, this is the Hebrew number in Strong's. 3444, it's pronounced Yeshua. That's why He said, Thou shalt call His name Jesus, for He shall save His people from their sins. The original Hebrew was Yeshua. It doesn't matter how you pronounce His name. Jesus and Yeshua are the same person. But what's beautiful is, is that when you understand what the Hebrew word means, He is our salvation. He bore your sins and my sins in His own body upon the tree. He was raised from the dead that we might rise to walk in newness of life. Therefore with joy shall you draw water out of the wells of salvation. For great is the Holy One of Israel in the midst of thee, in your heart. When you look up the word midst, it means in the middle part, in the heart of a man. What we are seeing here about how Christ wants to dwell inside of His people, that is exactly what Satan is attempting to counterfeit. That's what he's doing through Hollywood, through the movies, through literature, He's influencing people. He's gaining access to their hearts. As they yield themselves to obey Him, He moves in. He steps in. And it may be small steps. It may just be the influence. He's whispering in your ear to get you to sin. But through continual transgression, the walls of protection that keep Him outside are broken down. That's why we see people now everywhere that are struggling and they don't know how to get free. The deification of man. I'm going to give you a quote here from a, a New Age author and guru. This man's name is Eckhart Tolle. And he has been a prominent speaker many times on the Oprah Winfrey show. Now she will say she believes in God, but what God is she talking about? And if she believes in the Lord God Almighty and His Son Jesus Christ, why is she inviting New Agers to come and promote their philosophies on her show. Listen to what he says. Heaven is not a location, but an inner realm of consciousness. My mind is part of God's mind. I am very holy. My holiness is my salvation, and my salvation comes from me. 
We need to pray for that man. I can't imagine what he's going to be thinking when the, when the clouds are torn open and the Son of God comes riding in. This plan has been in place for millennia, from the very beginning. If you go to our website, we have got a lot of quotes. We have a lot of pictures, and it would take too long to, to show all of them. But all the way back to Babylon, all the way back to Egypt, the same plan of Lucifer, of Satan, is depicted in their paintings. On the far left, you see a, a painting of what's called an Ouroboros, or a caduceus staff. The Ouroboros is a single serpent swallowing its own tail, but sometimes it will be depicted as the caduceus, which is two serpents entwined and traveling up a staff. The second picture in the middle, this is a Hindu and a Buddhist representation of what they call the chakras of the human body. These things do not exist, but they depict them, and nowadays you're seeing more scientific, more elaborate depictions. Um, they show that there are seven main points or gateways within the body. The lowest one is between the legs. The lowest one um, is at a point between the groin and the anus. The next one is below the navel. It's two to three inches below the navel. That's the one that martial arts focus on, to breathe deeply and to focus their, their thought, their will on what's below the navel. And then they go up. You reach the throat, and then you reach the third eye, and the final one is called the, sh the crown chakra. What is troubling is that in the martial arts, in yoga, in tai chi, in all these pagan occultic philosophies and teachings, all of the focus is sent to the point two to three inches below the navel. Yet we have been told that that's where the base passions reside. Now when I say base passions, it means base desires, your desire for reproduction, your desire for food. But yet what they do is, is they tell you that there is a, a power the Hindus call it kundalini. It's a form of yoga. They say that this power is in the form of a serpent, and it is supposed to be coiled exactly three and a half times at the sacrum. And you are supposed to, through qigong, through yoga practice, through tai chi, through meditation, you're supposed to focus your energy, your mind and your will down there to awaken this serpent. And they say that that serpent, you want to encourage it through meditation and through these Eastern practices to climb the stairway of the spinal column. And as it climbs and passes through each of these gateways, these chakras, and it reaches the third eye, then you are told that that doorway will be opened and you will have extra sensory perception. And I'm, I'm familiar with that because we trained in that. After I had been in the martial arts for a number of years, I made discipleship and a fifth dawn in Kung Fu. And I'll never forget what happened. The week after myself and another man made discipleship in that system, we showed up together for a private lesson with the instructor, with the Grand Master. And he told us something that I will never forget him saying. He looked at us and he said, Men, we're going to begin training now in what the martial arts is really about. He said, the things that you're going to learn to do over the next few years, he said, if they were done a few hundred years ago, you would have been called wizards. Now, this man was a professed Christian, but it was amazing to see the change that came over his face when he said that. And... Even though I went to church every Sabbath, even though I, I professed Christ and I, I read my Bible, you know, 30 minutes a day, um, I was spending 8 or 10 hours a day training in the martial arts. And when he said we would be considered wizards if we were doing three or 400 years ago what he was going to teach us to do, it, it made cold chills run up and down my spine. I was excited, nervous, but excited because I thought, wow. We finally are going to learn how to do those things that we see in the movies. 
And I remember the first, the first drill, the first thing that he, he really pushed us to achieve. He told us we had to be able to change the temperature of our body with our mind. And we would stand in horse stance for hours. And it would be 70 degrees or 80 degrees or 90 degrees. Sometimes it would be 95 degrees. And he would come out and he would say, I want you to make your body cool. And we, he would come back and check on us every 30 minutes or so until we were able to get the body cool through thought, through self-hypnosis, through repeating over and over again what we were told to do. Sometimes he would take us out and it would be 35 or 40 degrees. There'd be snow on the ground. And he would tell us, I want you to raise the body temperature. I want you to break a sweat. And as we progressed in this training, it got to the point where he came out and he would say, I want you to make your right arm hot and I want the ring finger or the pinky or the pointer finger to be cold. And we would focus and me meditate and breathe until that happened. After we achieved that, that was when we moved up. And then he began really teaching us. Then he started teaching us how to communicate with one another from miles away without a phone. Have no idea how it happens other than you willed it to happen. There is no science that can make that happen. I would think about, you know, my partner, the other disciple, didn't know where he was. Sometimes he would be in Oregon and I'd be in, in Tennessee. And he would be hunting and I would be, you know, there at the school teaching. And I would think about him and I would tell him, I want you to call me. I want you to call me. And I would just keep saying those words over and over again in my mind. And sometimes 10 minutes, sometimes 30 minutes, he'd call. And sometimes I would be there teaching and all of a sudden an impression would come to me. You need to call your partner. And I'd pick the phone up and start to dial and he'd be on the other side. Was it me doing anything? Was it him doing anything? No. It was the fallen angels. Because an angel can travel like lightning. So they would impress me what to say. They would speak those words in my ears and then they would go and do them so that I thought it was me doing it. Do you understand how Satan is counterfeiting the work of God? Does the Bible not tell us that it is God that works in us, both to will and to do of His good pleasure? Does it not say in Colossians 1.27 that it is Christ in us, the hope of glory? This whole battle is over possession of our hearts. What the New Age, what the Eastern mystics, what the occult is working toward is what Satan is, has tried to do since the very beginning, since the Garden of Eden, with the deification of man. When he was cursed as he possessed that serpent or as he manifested himself in that form as a serpent, the Lord told him, you'll no longer ascend. You're cursed to the ground. Now it's funny, we don't have a, a, an actual fact for this, but there's a lot of evidence that the serpent before it was cursed had wings. Don't know that for a fact, but if you look at the oldest records in the world and drawings of a serpent, the serpent looks like a Chinese dragon. And the Chinese dragon doesn't look big and bulky, it looks like a serpent with wings. This is the founder of Aikido, Moriya Ueshiba. He said, the God of peace is very great and enjoins all that is divine and enlightened in every land. So sometimes when I use the word Jehovah or Yahweh or Yehovah or Elohim or Adonai, it's not because it's a salvation. I'm using that because this man used the word God. That's not a bad word because we know what it means. But when I'm talking to others, I try to make sure they understand which God I'm talking about, which Lord Jesus Christ I'm talking about. Yeshua said, The divine is not something high above us. It is in heaven and it is in the earth. It is inside us. The art of peace I practice has room for each of the world's eight million gods and I cooperate with them all. This is the founder of Aikido. I know all sorts of people and I know all sorts of Christians that train in Aikido and they say, I don't do that. I don't bow. I'm not doing the spiritual. Well, 
if you're training in the art, you have no you have no way of stopping the influence of that spirit that inspired him. What about yoga? I'm not even going to try to pronounce this man's name. Swami. Listen to his words. Each soul is potentially divine. The goal is to manifest this divinity within by controlling nature. Now he's not talking about the birds and the trees. Listen to his next words. By controlling nature, both externally and internally. Within the Chinese thinking, they have what's called a microcosmic orbit and a macro. Macrocosmic orbit is the orbit of the planets and the worlds and the suns and the moons. It's outer space. It's our solar system. Microcosmic, they say, what is above is also beneath within us. So they train you how to move these, quote, energies or spirits through the body, inside the body, on an orbit. He says, do this. Control external and internal energy and nature. Do this either by work or by worship or by psychic control or by philosophy. By one or more or all of these and be free. This is the whole of religion. This thought pattern of us being gods, of, of God being an energy and not a divine being. This is coming into the church. It's manifesting in churches of all denominations. It's being brought in through something called spiritual formation. I know people that teach this. Many of the pastors don't even realize what they have gotten themselves involved and entrapped in. By learning from men that have been influenced by these Eastern mystics, and these Eastern gurus. When these men are, are trained and they're taught and they read these books and they go to school for spiritual formation, when many of our students are going to universities and colleges, their professors at Christian universities and colleges are handing them literature by pagan writers. They don't realize that just as we receive the Holy Spirit through the words of Christ, so we will receive unholy spirits through reading words that were inspired by fallen angels. Spiritual formation. Many of the, the men that promote this movement, they tell you that you have God inside of you because God is just an energy. And He's actually inside everybody. There's no real need for what happened at Calvary. They do not profess or endorse an actual atonement that Christ stood in our place and they're promoting people to believe this Eastern thought that God is everywhere. He's in everything. Recently, I was stunned and very upset. I saw that members of our own church were reprinting an old book called The Living Temple by John Harvey Kellogg. And I can't imagine after all the statements that we have been given under inspiration of Almighty God, that this work was of Satan. This work was not of God. This was the alpha of apostasy. And Ellen White said, I fear and tremble for our people, for the Omega that's coming. She said, if you want to know what the Omega is, look at the alpha. That was the living temple. That was pantheism. How did these ideas... How were they introduced to the Christian faith? Eastern mystics, the Jewish people, the Orthodox Jews, when they went into Babylonian captivity, they learned many of the ways of Babylon. They wrote a book called the Kabbalah. And unfortunately, many Jews, many people that are members of the Messianic faith, without knowing what they're doing, they're beginning to take thoughts and principles from the writings of these Jewish mystics as well as Christian mystics. Writings out of the Kabbalah and incorporating those with biblical Christianity. This man, his name was Ignatius Loyola. He was the founder of the Jesuits. Ignatius studied intensely 
mystical practices of the Far East. He wanted to understand the experiences that he saw the Hindus and the Buddhists and the Taoists experiencing. Because they said it was God. This is divine. And Ignatius thought, I want that experience. I want a religion that's not just belief, but I want to experience God. Now there's nothing wrong with that because God wants us to know His presence. We should crave and hunger for His presence because He said, I'll be a comforter to you. You can't be comforted unless there's some sort of an experience there. He wants that for us, but it has to be based on truth, not on error. Ignatius began bringing these practices of the Eastern mystics into his own religion. He wrote a book called The Spiritual Exercises of Ignatius. And now that book is being used as a theme book, as a study book in yoga schools, in Tai Chi schools, in Qigong schools. So these Eastern mystics are going to Ignatius to learn about his way of channeling these spirits. This is called the River's Edge. This is a church organization that I found online, and there are many of them there. But if you look at their curriculum, they're, they're talking about the things that they offer in their retreats. They offer Tai Chi. They offer Qigong. They offer yoga. These are churches that are offering this. And many people will say, it's just for stretching. It's just for relaxation. It's just for self-defense. Um, it's beautiful. And I tell people, if you need exercise, go jog. You know, go play basketball. Do something, but don't do something that has got spiritual roots. I had a man that helped me when I was, when I was fighting to get free from the martial arts. And he told me something. He said, if the DNA is bad, everything that comes from it is bad. Jesus said, you can't take pure water out of a filthy stream. You can't get good out of something that is founded in paganism. This is another website. It's called Ignatian Silent Retreats. Mission and Ministry Retreats. And this is the same website, Yoga and Zen in Christian Context. And they have a video there where you can watch this man talking about how we can use yoga and Zen which is Buddhism, it's also known as Chan Buddhism, how we can use this in Christianity to help our walk with God. I want you to listen to a statement that the Lord has given us through His servant. The soul that is yielded to Christ becomes His own fortress, which He holds, which Christ holds in a revolted world. And He intends that no authority shall be known in your soul but His own. A soul thus kept in possession by the heavenly agencies is impregnable to the assaults of Satan. Look at that word, possession. The soul that is kept in possession by Christ. You know, if you want to read something interesting, read Proverbs chapter 8 where it talks about wisdom. And we know that that's speaking of Christ. And he speaks of his father and he says, The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way. I want the Lord to take me holy. You want to yield everything to him. My appetite, my desires, my plans for the day, the way I dress. I want to be kept in possession by him as a valuable treasure. But unless we yield ourselves to the control of Christ, we shall be dominated by the wicked one we must inevitably be under the control of the one or the other of the two great powers that are contending for the supremacy of the world. I'll never forget, I listened to a man a few years ago, a creation scientist named Ken Ham, and he was speaking at a conference, and they held this conference at the Civic Coliseum, and it was in the middle of the day. It was an all-day event. You would not believe how many public school teachers in our country, in Tennessee, took their students out of class and took them to see about creation. I was praising the Lord that you still have men and women that are willing to stand for truth. They said, this is about science. We're taking a field trip. He said something. He said, when you're talking to someone 
an atheist about evolution or about creation. He said, they're going to they're gonna try to persuade you to step off of the Bible as your foundation. He said, what they'll often say is, let's set our religious beliefs to the side and let's just stand on middle ground. You leave your Christianity and I'll leave my atheism. Let's just stand on science. And he said something that I won't forget. He said, there is no middle ground. There is no gray. The moment you step off of the Word of God, you are standing on Satan's ground. And the atheist and the evolutionist, without, without meaning to, they know this is happening. They know if you step off of the Bible, you have nothing to stand on. It is not necessary for us to deliberately choose the service of the kingdom of darkness in order to come under its dominion. We have only to neglect to ally ourselves with the kingdom of light. If we do not cooperate with the heavenly agencies, Satan will take possession of the heart and will make it his abiding place. We see that in the end of the world, Satan is trying to take possession of mankind. And we see from the scriptures in the end of the world, God is doing everything he can to take possession of that which the blood of Christ has bought and paid for in full. We are his possession. Listen to what he says in Romans chapter 8 verse 19. This is beautiful. For the earnest expectation of all creation is waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. The New Agers and the Eastern Mystics are not the only ones. Satan is counterfeiting what he knows to be the truth. He's counterfeiting this by saying man can be divine. It says the whole creation is waiting for the manifestation of the sons. The word sons in the Greek means children begotten of God. Not just adopted, begotten. Listen to 2 Peter 1 verse 4. It says, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, blood-bought promises, that by these promises ye might be partakers of the divine nature. Having escaped the corruption, that means death and decay that is in this world through carnal desires and fleshly lusts. How are we begotten again? We think, how can I be like God I grew up my whole life thinking, I know I'm not right. Why am I still struggling with sin? I don't understand. You know, when I want to do right, why is it that it's overwhelming to do wrong? And Christians around the world are saying, how long do I have to wrestle with this? How long do I have to drag this dead body around with me? For I was crucified with Christ. How can I be born again? Of all the texts in Scripture, that one interview with Nicodemus lays the whole plan of salvation out. Nicodemus in John chapter 3, he was a righteous man by man's standards. He wasn't committing adultery. He was paying tithe. He went to church every week on Sabbath. He kept the commandments and the statutes of the Lord. He wasn't living a fake. But he was still a son of Adam trying to do what's right. And Jeremiah tells us something. Jeremiah says, can an Ethiopian change his skins? Can a leopard change his spots? Then, if they can, you may learn to do well that are accustomed to do evil. When I read that, it was like, that's me. Father, I don't want to battle with this flesh anymore. Change me. And I asked him, just like Nicodemus, how is this possible? And Jesus said, are you a master in Israel? Are you a teacher of my people and you don't understand this? Let me share with you a secret. Jesus wouldn't have asked Nicodemus that if it had been impossible for Nicodemus to know about the new birth from the Old Testament Scriptures. The new birth was in the Old Testament Scriptures. I'll give you the first example. When Abraham was told to offer Isaac, his only begotten son, upon that altar. And he knew, I've waited for a hundred years for this son. This is the promise of God. God promised me a son and now he gave it to me. And God said, 
I want to test your faith again. I want to show what I can do. He told Abraham, go and offer your son to me as a burnt offering. And Abraham had to wrestle there. God promised, but now he's telling me to kill him. But God promised, but now he's telling me to kill him. That seems like a contradiction. How can I reconcile this? Do you know what Hebrews says? And do you know what Romans says, chapter 4? Hebrews 11 and Romans 4? It said, Abraham took Isaac because he counted that God was able to raise him from the dead, from whence also he had received him in a figure. Abraham said, God made a promise that in my seed all nations of the earth will be blessed. God said, offer him as a sacrifice. That only leaves one option. God has to raise the dead. So how can we be born again? How can I be begotten anew? James chapter 1, verse 18 through 22. It says, For of His own will begat He us with the word of truth, with the word of verity. Begat, is that present tense or future tense or past tense? Of His own will begat, it's already been done. When were we begotten again with the word of truth? It says that we should be a kind of first fruits of His creation. The Scriptures tell us if any man or woman be in Christ, you are a new creation. You are first fruits in Christ. 1 Peter verse, chapter 1, verse 22 through 25. He elaborates a little bit more. He gives us more insight. He says, being begotten again, not of corruptible seed, not of seed that can pass away, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Which effectually worketh also in you that believe. For all flesh is as grass, and the glory of man is as the flower of grass. I can remember when I was in the martial arts, working out and punching and kicking, and you know, you'd go home and you'd look in, your, look in the mirror to see if you were gaining anything, and you know, am I getting any taller? I remember as a young man, you know, is my muscles getting any bigger? And you're looking at yourself trying to do something. And the Lord says, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. All flesh is as grass and the glory of man. All your abilities is as the flower of grass. The grass withereth and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of Jehovah endureth forever. And this is the word which by the glad tidings we proclaim unto you. The word of God cannot fail. So you think in your mind, what promise do I need today? Because God's Word says today is the day of salvation if you only hear my voice. I want, to, I want you to listen to what the Lord says about when we were begotten again with the Word of truth. Wherefore, I also cease not making mention of you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revealing of the knowing or knowledge of Him. Remember what John 17, 3 said? This is life eternal, that we might know Him. What are we to know about Him? That He's faithful, that He cannot lie, that His word will not return unto Him void. That ye may know what is the hope of His calling, and what is the exceeding greatness of His power to usward who believe according to the working of His mighty power? And you say, what kind of power does God have? And He tells you, this is the place. If you want to see how powerful God Almighty is, this is where you look. It says, according to the working of His mighty power, which He wrought in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and set Him at His own right hand in the heavens. Do you know that the Scriptures say beyond a shadow of a doubt, that every iniquity of every human being that has ever lived was placed upon Christ. He did not only take the punishment for our sins, He became guilty for our sins. 
He was made to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. So what kind of God do we, do we serve? Christ was guilty. He had the sins of the whole world upon Him, and the Father had made a covenant of peace with His Son in eternity past before the world began. Zechariah chapter 6, verse 13 talks about that. It says, The covenant of peace shall be between them both. And in that covenant, the Father spoke to His Son and He said, Man's going to fall. It's going to change His very nature. He's going to be tempted and fall. But if you will take their place, if you will exchange yourself for them, if you'll become sin for them, even Eric Wilson's sin, my adultery, my fornication, my divorce, my blasphemy, my cursing, my swearing, my lust, my bitterness, my anger, my selfishness, my pride. If Christ, if you will take those sins, I swear to you, I will raise you the third day. He made an oath that he could not go back on. And do you know what the Son of God said to his father? He said, I swear I'll carry all of them. He swore by himself. Now I want you to listen to something. I want you to hear this. And behold, there was a great earthquake. For the angel of the Lord descended from heaven, clothed with the panoply of God. This angel left the heavenly courts. The bright beams of God's glory went before him and illuminated his pathway. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers of Christ's tomb did tremble and shake and became as dead men. Now, O priests and rulers, where is the power of your guard? Brave soldiers that have never been afraid of human power are now captives taken without sword or spear. For the face they look upon is not the face of a mortal warrior. It is the face of the mightiest of the Lord's host. The messenger is he who fills the position from which Satan fell. It is the one who on the hills of Bethlehem proclaimed Christ's birth. The earth trembles at his approach. The host of darkness flee, and as he rolls away the stone, heaven seems to come down to earth. The soldiers see him removing the stone as he would a pebble, and they hear him cry. Listen to these words, because Ellen White says they were spoken to you and I. Thou Son of God, come forth. Thy Father calls thee, that we might know the hope of his calling that you might know the hope of His calling. Thou Son of God, come forth. Thy Father calls thee. They see Jesus come forth from the grave, and they hear Him proclaim over the rent sepulcher, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in Me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. I want to share a scripture with you that I don't have on screen. This is an important scripture. If you have your Bible, turn with me there. This is Isaiah chapter 52. And listen to these words with what we just read in mind. Because he's speaking to you. When you read your Bible, put your name in the verse. Because that's God's word to you. He says, awake, awake. Put on thy strength, O Zion. Put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem. The garments of the righteousness of Christ. The holy city, for henceforth there shall no more come into you the uncircumcised and the unclean. Remember how many times Christ and His disciples cast out the unclean spirits. He says, shake thyself from the dust like you had just come up from the tomb. Arise and sit down with me in heavenly places. O Jerusalem, loose thyself from the bands of thy neck, O captive daughter of Zion. For thus saith the Lord, ye have sold yourselves for naught, but you have been redeemed without money. I encourage each of us, 
as we're studying the Scriptures. Yes, it's important to know about the dangers of martial arts, but the only reason to look at the counterfeit is so that we can know what the true is. And the only way to know what the counterfeit is is by looking at the true, beholding the true. So when Satan is trying to possess men and make men into, quote, gods, know that that's only a counterfeit of what he wants to do, what the Lord God wants to do in your life and in mine. Let's close with prayer. Father in heaven, Father, we thank you for what you and what your son have done for us. Father, we thank you that you raised your son from the dead. For if Christ be not raised, we are yet dead in our sins. But Father, thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through him. Father, be with each person tonight that is here and those that are watching. I pray, Father, that we will open your word and as we read aloud your promises, that you will open our eyes and our hearts to hear your voice. Send your angels to fight for your people, Father. Send your spirit to win us to thee. In Christ Jesus' name, we pray and thank you. Amen.